it is it is absolutely not racist to point out facts. Hey everybody, welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard, and this is the podcast where we talk about things that matter. Uh, my guest today is Brian Shannon. He is a husband and a father. He is an author and a pastor, and he's educated in many different areas, including education. Uh, we're going to be talking about the family, in particular, the black family, the breakdown of the black family, and uh, talking about his new book, Missing Pillars. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I pray that it's edifying and helpful. Brian, how you doing, brother? Welcome to the show. Great, Richard. Thanks for having me on, brother. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm glad we connected. I know we were on uh, together on a big group video, I guess a month or so ago, maybe six or eight weeks ago, right. with uh, Jason. There, dear woke Christian. Dear woke Christian. Um, yeah. So, missing pillars. I mean, talking about that. That's kind of really going to be the focus of our conversation. I will, for the audience, put the link. You can get the. Uh, actual physical book as well as the uh, ebook uh, but i'll put that in the description and you can check that out and uh, i urge you to buy it it's very inexpensive what 12 dollars, 13 bucks something like that mm -hmm. um and it's well worth it as far as a read goes because you you tackle a lot of different things which we'll get into i've got <laughs> lots of notes uh but one thing i wanted to start with and this is kind of in the middle of the book at page 82 Mm -hmm. uh, you said we were not made in the likeness of animals. Mm. Uh, we are chiefly motivated, who are chiefly motivated by instinct and biological impulse. We are image bearers of an eternal, moral, infinitely intelligent God who created us with a unique sense of dignity, both in our sexuality and our intellectual identity. We weren't made to have unbridled sex. We were made to honor God and carry out a sense of purpose and function to worship, create, innovate, and produce life affirming things that propagate human flourishing. Mm. I could go on. Uh, so that's kind of the couching I'd like to have us, you know, start with. Um, that obviously you're a believer. You came to Christ uh, several years back. Uh, this book is both about your story. It's biolo uh, biological, biographical, uh, but also you get into quotes and statistics, and you talk about a lot of things that uh, I think a lot of people just don't want to talk about. You sure. know, for lack of being called racist, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are maybe they lean left or they're sympathetic or maybe they're a Christian and they're like, well, you know, Democrats, Republicans, they just uh, they want to help people differently, you know, but I can't really speak into that. That's that's their issue. That's the black communities. Issue. That's African-American right. culture. And right. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't <laughs> I used to live in L.A., uh, lived in Louisville for a number of years. And I've worked with, I've been around multiple different ethnicities, different types of people. And skin tone doesn't really play much role, really. I mean, I think some of it to a degree within your own um, raising, but a mm -hmm. lot of it's just your worldview, who you're right. raising, who, who's raising you, who you're with. Uh, Absolutely. But I guess, first question, why did you, you probably know the answer, but what brought you to write this book, Missing Pillars? Good question. Good question. Thanks for asking. Um, so... I wrote the book because number one, if you, you know, as, as you read my story a little bit and got to know a little bit about where I came from, raised on, uh, uh, by a single mother in the inner city environment, in the inner city context, Brooklyn, New York City. Uh, we moved out of the city when I was, you know, uh, the young teen, uh, late 80s. Uh, we moved to you know the Carolinas, but we were still uh, in, a, in a in a sort of same socioeconomic situation where you know we're we're still in poverty, you know, single mother, and so with that came all of the ills, right? All of and and, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the statistics and the uh, the facts that I that I sort of cited in my book about what what impact does growing up in a single parent home have? For one, let me start with uh, a you know. President Barack Obama said this. I don't quote President Barack Obama often, right? Because <laughs> I don't quite identify with his politics. Yeah. However, he quoted uh, some, some uh, statistics and facts that were uh, actually rooted in the, the the research of this whole issue of father absence in the black community, or just mm -hmm. father absence in general. But he said, and this was you know back in two thousand eight, you know as he you know as he was launching into his presidency as he was in his campaign, that a kid growing up without a dad is five times more likely to be born in poverty. 
nine times more likely to have problems in school, whether it be not graduate or get kicked out of school with suspension rates, because we've heard, you know, suspension rates are high amongst, you know, African-American kids, right? Um, but there's also a 75% father absence issue in the African-American community. So there's a correlation. Um, so he said five times more likely to be born in poverty, nine times more likely to have problems in school, and 20 times more likely to be in the prison system. OK, mm. to, to be to be, uh, you know, involved in uh, criminality or, or, or the prison system. So I grew up in that context. Why did I write the book? Because I grew up single parent, inner city, poverty. Right. Having problems in school myself. Um, but as you see, according to my bio, I ended up uh, eventually uh, graduating high school, going to college, getting a master's degree, um, starting, you know, getting into the prof my professional career as an educator, as a school administrator, a certified school principal, um, but then got into the ministry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been the direction of my life in the last five years or so. But uh, went, went into full time ministry, for the, you know, got, just went into full time ministry last year, this past year. Okay. Um, the Lord called me into full time ministry, um, but just been, been working, you know, for God, you know, on a, a bivocational, you know, level, so to speak, uh, for a number of years. So um, the book to me was very personal. Um, I, I'd heard lots of things about these 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 facts, you know, you know, this father absence is 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 rampant in the black community, and I knew that growing up, just with you know anecdotes, you know, every most people that I knew, about three out of four guys didn't have a dad growing up, you know, yeah. in the house. I mean, there was a dad somewhere around, but in terms of dads that I saw growing up in the house, married to a mother, um, married to the you know the, to their biological mother, I, I didn't see it, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the rate of about like I said, seventy five percent of people I knew who were you know who shared my you know ethnicity. You know, it wasn't true for them in, in the particular no. context in which I grew up. Now, outside of that, you know, if you go to certain areas in the suburbs where, you know, the, the economics, you know, uh, uh, reality of the people are di bit different, it's not necessarily the same thing. But in the inner city, urban context, it was the case. And that, and according to the research and the data, uh, and as we'll talk about Patrick Moynihan and the Moynihan Report, uh, yeah. where he kind of pointed these things out early in American, uh, uh, you know, uh, during the civil rights era, um, he was pointing these things out. It was true that in the urban areas of our of our nation, um, you saw super, you know, it, th those the population of those urban areas became more concentrated with, you know, ethnic minorities and father absence became an issue, a growing rising issue at that time, which spiraled um, you know, no. to the to the issues that we see today. So anyway, problem is not skin tone, <laughs> right. really. I mean, the problem is not uh, um, this thing or that thing. But as you've said in your book and, and aptly pointed out, well. It's family and fatherlessness, yep. especially Absolutely. and this generational because, frankly, yep. brother, I mean, I know several people uh, who they look like they're my cousins. I mean, there's right. one lady, she's 70 and I love her, but her mom was divorced. This lady who's now 70 is divorced. Her daughter, who's 50 something, is divorced. Her daughter's daughter, I think, is divorced. And there's kids out of wedlock over here and over there and, and, mm -hmm. and new marriages here. And I'm just like, and this is just random Kentucky. Right. right. And this is because, you know, the guys were lazy. The women didn't want to submit. It was a culture of divorce and, you know, up in the 50s, sure. 60s and 70s and, you know, sexual revolution. And mm -hmm. so it's it's not I'm not I don't want to take, you know, take any credit away from um, your book because there no, is, no, no. There is a, a massive problem in the black community for Sure. Sure. But melanin has little to do with it. At least Absolutely. that's my understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned, Richard, you know, the, yeah. the, the enemy of the family is an equal opportunity offender. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's, it has nothing. Like you yeah, said, man. it has nothing, nothing to do with race. And in fact, um, I like to point out this. Um, number one, it, as you mentioned you know, earlier, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to have this conversation, particularly if you're not a melanated person. You say, hey, to have this conversation, you're pegged as a racist. So, yes, there is real racism, as you pointed out. Right. There are yeah. individuals out there who have a, uh, um, you know, don't have a regenerated mind from which they're speaking. Right. They're not speaking from a regenerated heart. So they are spouting things that are anti that are ungodly and, and, and are anti scripture, anti truth um, about people groups. Right. Because we have to have a biblical anthropology in that we do believe that all people are made in the image of God. Right. We are equally yeah. made in the image of God. However, we are fallen. And so because of our fallenness, um, the enemy, uh, you know, deals with cultures in different ways, in different cultures. You you find sin, but it, it, it manifests itself in different ways. But it's all sin. 
Yeah. Right. And so we look, we can tend to look at the sin of different groups of people that had, that has been impacted and we can look at ourselves as, as better than them because, you know, sin ha doesn't quite manifest itself in our culture the same way. And our sin is a little more hidden than their sin. Right. Yeah. But we're all sinners in the eyes of a, of a holy God. Um, but it is, it is absolutely not racist to point out facts. Let yeah. me say that we got to, we have to <laughs> do it. With, no, that's good. Yeah. It's, it, you know, we have to do that. I think we have to do it with a heart of compassion, you know, with 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 this. And regardless of how genuine you are, you're going to still sometimes be pegged as racist or insensitive. But if we do it, if we're doing it with a motive that says, listen, I truly want to understand the issue at, at hand here. I truly want to understand the issue that have impacted, your, you know, the black community or whatever. Let me state this, first of all. First of all, 70 to 75 percent of black children today are growing up without dads. You yeah. look at that and you say, whoa, see, that's I knew there was a problem with black people. Right. But it was not always the case <laughs> right. back in the 1920s and early 1900s, post slavery, you know, in the antebellum South, um, the blacks in America were among, you know, the, you know, are, are, are the family, the family unit, the, the nuclear family in the black community rivaled that of white America. And in yeah. some cases surpassed it in the early 1900s. So, you, you know, so you go from the 1920s, um, you know, Thomas Sowell. You know, uh, indicated this in the 1920s to the 1950s, the black nuclear family and Walter Williams was also a key, uh, you know, a researcher in, in, in quoting the, the economic state of the black community and the, and the social socioeconomic growth of the black community from post slavery. The 1920s to the 1950s, blacks in America saw the deepest decline, the sharpest decline in poverty, you know. Nuclear family was intact at extremely high rates that rivaled anybody else in America. And you say, well, whoa, what, what in the world happened? And so, you know, the poverty went from 87 percent to 47 percent among mm -hmm. black families in America from 1920s to the 1950s. And it, it went another, I think, 18 to 20 percent lower after that. Right. Wow. So we were you know, like like black America in a very racist America. were doing really well. Families were doing really well. Right. You had black colleges that were that were birthed. You had black scientists. You had George Washington Carver. You had all these individuals in the early 1900s, right? Booker T. Washington, these people who were, you know, developing, you know, and, and, and organizing and, and creating and doing things, right? And innovating, yeah, right? Yeah. Out of poverty, out of, out, of, out of adversity. And so you say, well, what was different? This was pre-civil rights. Yeah. By 1960s, Patrick Moynihan, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, he was the assistant secretary to Linda B. Johnson. And he started noticing that there was a, an issue, a burgeoning issue in the urban sectors of the nation. He said, listen, I'm seeing, based on my research here, because he, he, he was collecting information and collecting data from the local departments of labor and, and, and different areas across the nation and, and our major cities, where at the time you had a lot of African-Americans uh, you know, migrating to. All right. And so these urban areas are growing and he sees that 25 percent of black kids are growing up without dads in the 60s. This is about mm -hmm. 1964, 65, 20 percent, uh, 25 percent of black kids growing up without dads. Fast forward, Richard, to, to from 1965 to 1985, it goes from 25 percent to 75 percent. Well, you say, what in the world happened? Where did the fathers go? Well, uh, during Lyndon B. Johnson's presidency, we have what Lyndon B. Johnson, uh, you know, <clears throat> his, the legacy of his presidency was the war on poverty, right? Mm. The welfare state. Walter Williams said this. He a great economist, right? Walter Williams said that the welfare state, the implementation of, public, of, of the welfare system under Lyndon B. Johnson, did to the black community what slavery, Jim Crow, and the harshest racism could not do. And that was to take so to one, destroy the black family by taking the father out of the home. What happened was the father was incentivized mm. not to be in the home. Well, what did you have going on in the 60s? You had the sexual revolution. You had the feminist movement, which was telling women you don't need men in the home. And that was an ideology and a culture that was burgeoning. Then you have the government who comes in and says, OK, if there's no dad in the home, we'll give you a check. We'll pay you not to have a dad in the home. And so dads were saying, okay, you know what? Here's a free out. I can have sex and have babies and just and, and shirk my responsibility and shirk my duties. And mm -hmm. Walter Williams said this. He said, what he said, any great uh, any any economist, anybody knows anything about the economy, knows this. That if you tax something, you get less of it. If you subsidize something, you get more of it. And the government began <laughs> to subsidize slovenly behavior. Men were incentivized to leave the home because they didn't have to take care of the responsibilities. The government took their place. Yeah. Yeah, no, and that's, and that's really, you touch on that in the first, what, chapter or two. Uh, I mean, you, it's throughout the book, but um, 
it's just, I mean, that's your first page, page three. I mean, you talk about, yeah, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, 1965, of course, 63, you know, JFK is assassinated that same decade. MLK is assassinated. Malcolm X assassinated. Robert uh, F. Kennedy is assassinated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and lots and lots of turmoil. Is it when 1964 is a civil rights act? Um, and, you know, there, you, we look back and, you know, I think we have the rose colored glasses a lot of times. And even as believers, um, and people who haven't really experienced, I mean, I'm from California, you know, ne slavery was never there. Mm -hmm. uh, civil rights, never there. Jim Crow, never there. Um, and so, I mean, not in any tangible way at all, not like, you know, Virginia or Georgia or Mississippi or something. And so right there, you know, that's my experience. Now is my experience better than yours or less than yours? No, sure. but it's just, I think a lot of people, and now we have California wanting to pay reparations and it's like, well, this, this is not going to work. I mean, you're now you're giving free money, which obviously is anti-biblical in general. Anyway, right. but I think some people, even in the, the church, the kind of, you know, big evangelical, big Eva, mushy middle kind of, oh, well, you know, eh, I think we should help them out though. You know, because if we just give them a little bit more, maybe then if, if we just incentivize a little more, if we just kick back a little bit of reparations, if we do, this if we if we hire i mean what's it matt chandler you know his one of his goofy famous quotes of you know an anglo white and, a, and an african-american <laughs> seven give me the african-american seven but not a six if he's a six then he'll be a token and right, like, right you literally right, just yeah. killed your own argument right. in the midst of making an argument like what i mean you literally you're you're showing partiality you're you're yeah. being literally yeah. racist yeah. <laughs> yeah. and and uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Moynihan goes, I mean, you said 25% and that's what it is now. Right. Isn't right. that what it is? It was six to 9% in white households, you know, Anglo, Caucasian, whatever. Light Absolutely. Skin. Six to 9% then 25% in, in the black African-American household. And now it's 75% and one third Hispanic and in about a quarter, 25% in yeah. Caucasian. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, to, to, so everybody's to, just worse. Everybody's absolutely. worse. Absolutely. Everybody's worse. And you look at <laughs> that, like, and that's a great point. Golly. Because, look, look, you know, the total uh, statistic looks like this it's 70, like you said, 75% for African Americans. Um, it's 50, it's, or, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, 50%, 60% actually in the Native American community. 60% Native American community. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't actually cite that in my book, but that's a, that's the thing I, I found out later on. If I do an expanded, you know, a revised edition of my book, yeah. I'll actually include that. But 60% the Native American or Native American, uh, Native American reserves, 50% amongst uh, Hispanics and about 30% in the white community right now. Wow. Is it? Oh, it's even worse. Wow. Yes. Yes. It's even worse. Yeah. And I so it, it is grow It has become worse for everybody. And like I said, again, Satan, who the, the Lucifer, the enemy of God, who hates the family, by the way. Right. Because he yeah. knows that the family is at the center of how God has designed to deal with humanity. Right. One, the gospel is, is central to how God is related to man. Right. And in the, in the coming of Christ and the incarnation of Christ. But the family is the headquarters and the, the central space in which God deals with humanity, because it's out of the family that we grow, we grow from a mother and a father that yeah. we, we get our perception of who God is. And it's, it's there. We're supposed to learn who God is by our mother and father. Well, destroy that. Kids have no chance to learn about God unless right. You know, again, God sovereignly and providentially uses the gospel preaching. And by the way, I, I do want to mention as well that not only is my book about, you know, the, the, the degradation and the, and the, you know, what has happened in the black community and families in general, but the, 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 the subtopic is how the church was my lifeline and the church yeah. helped me out of that situation. So I certainly want to be able to unpack uh, that as well. Yeah. But go ahead. No, I mean, again, there's is very quotable. Uh, I mean, you 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 quote a lot, and then there's just a lot of your own experience and just expanding on. Therefore, this, you know, when you quote something, I mean, I I have lots of notes here. It's hard to really distill down what I want. One thing here, uh, I mean, you you mentioned is on page thirty two. Uh, is your mom said, "Son, you're a pretty good kid. Uh, you're not selling drugs." This is when you're what 14, 15, something like that. Uh, so actually, this is about time I'm about 16, 17. 16, 17. So, so your mom sits you down. Hey, son, you're a pretty good kid. You're not selling drugs. You're not breaking the law, as far as I know. You've not got any girls pregnant. But know this, son. No one is good enough to get into heaven on their own efforts. One day you have to stand before God and give an account of your life. Your only hope is repentance and placing faith in Christ. 
And yeah. I mean, you mentioned in your book, your mom, your mom died. Uh, she went through cancer treatment. She had rheumatoid arthritis before that. Uh, and she was working, slogging through, trying to make it and came to faith. Or, or I guess she came to faith young and then, you know, straight and, and sure. right. And, you know, it's the whole adage. I've said it before, you know, God meets you where you are, not where you should be. You right. know? And, and sometimes I think we people who are, you know, dare I say privileged, use the word. And we're all privileged to a degree. Right. But Absolutely. there's some stuff most of it i didn't you don't earn it right you don't earn your salvation you don't earn your parents you don't earn a lot of things and yet somehow right. people kind of confuse this over that and yeah. they look at i mean there's trailers all around us here in kentucky and mm -hmm. there's it's it's a very light skinned uh county and it's just, <laughs> it's just a small 30 That's a good way to put it it's light skinned out there <laughs> it just is you know and man there's there's ghetto people they're there's trashy people they're just you know and uh, some of it's their own doing some of it's laziness some of it's their own their situation mm -hmm. they had no control you know their right. mom you know had them out of wedlock grandma had her had a wedlock etc cetera, etc cetera. um and they're told they're not going to amount to anything their dad right. is nowhere to be found right he's drinking he's doing this and that he's maybe yeah. locked up and so you know this this plague uh, and I, I think it's a plague. I would say that, you know, this pandemic really of, of fatherlessness, mm -hmm. especially in the black community, but yep. in all these others where, Hey, I'm going to cut a check. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. It's like, well, if I get married, then the money stops. And so right. now we got to right. make extra and it's just, but yeah. at the end of the day, it's Christ. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And, I appreciate that. Uh, not yeah, only and so just just to just to piggyback off what you were talking about there, Richard. Um, so one of the quotes, uh, you know, from from my book, I mentioned that I didn't grow up with, you know, seemingly a, any privilege. One, because mm -hmm. I don't believe in. I mean, like like you said, a lot of people are privileged. I call it blessed. A lot yeah. of people are blessed, you know, because the Bible says clearly that it's God who gives us the power to get wealth. It is God who lets the sun shine on the just and rain and sunshine on the just as well as the unjust. It is yeah. God who gives us all the things. It's God who, 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 who causes men to differ, right, in the way that he does. And so, um, yes, and, 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 and in, that, in the mix of that, there are choices, personal choices that cause people to be less blessed than others or less privileged than others and there are there are circumstances which we have no control that we're born into we don't have any control over the circumstances one to however one of the things that i mentioned was that i thank god that i had a pastor growing up who told me he was an african-american he was a melanated man he was a man of color he he never told me about racism well he i mean he mentioned that you know racism being a reality he grew up and in, in, came up in the 50s and 60s so mm -hmm. he certainly experienced racism you know but he never pointed to that as the biggest problem of his life he always talked about hard work. He put himself through college. He, he worked hard, you know, got a master's degree, went to Tuskegee University, right, mm -hmm. in the tradition of Booker T. Washington. Um, you know, he, he, you know, became an engineer, right, for a major phone company, right, and, and you know, was doing well for himself in the 60s and 70s as an African-American man making, making you know, over, over $50,000 a year. And, and in the 60s and 70s, you're making big money. That's you know what I'm saying? Idea. And you're able to take care of your family. And, you know, his wife has a master's degree it was in, in education. And so they were doing really well. They were, you know, high middle class, you know, black people, you know, you know who, who came from nothing. And so he taught me that. And he taught me to work hard and follow God and honor God. You know, he, you know, he never once said that you're a victim because you're born African-American or black in America because America is so systemically racist. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a victim and you need to, you know, you know, just, 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 just tout the victim mentality and, 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 and demand reparations. He never said that. He said work hard son yeah. he said he said honor god work hard and good things will happen and i teach my son that to this day and so one of the things that i said in my book is that i thank god that i, that I was that i was exposed to that kind of thinking and i realized that i was not a victim if anything i was a victim of the the choice of my parents not to have me within the bounds of marriage yeah. Right. I was a victim of that. Absolutely. Because the only reason I was born in poverty is because my father abandoned the family. Mm -hmm. The only reason, because again, go back to the statistics, a child growing up without a dad, five times more likely to be in poverty. The reason I was struggling in school is because I didn't have an environment that reinforced in the structure and accountability that children should have. You quoted, the, uh, I think you mentioned this, maybe we talked about it pre-show, but you know, Thomas Sowell uh, uh, said this, Thomas Sowell said, um, you know, no matter how much money you pour into education, if there's not somebody there in the house to yeah. make kids go to bed on time, to get, you know, to make sure they're doing their homework, to get them up to get to school on time, I don't care how much money you put in education, 
it they're not going to be as successful. They're not yeah. going to succeed. You're not going to see the results, right? So it's not just pouring more money onto it. It's not just pouring reparations and money into the black community that's going to help it. If the families are still in the disaster, and that's true for the white community, true for the Hispanic community, and true for the Native American community. Um, it's not money. It's not reparations. It's not these things. It's we have to get back to the framework of God, which says family at the center, which is the structure for 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 all of life, you know, for human life to flourish, you have to have family at the center. Yeah. No, it's it's really yeah. I think one thing that um is easy part of it part of it's like it's easy. Well like oh yeah okay you lo love your wife, love your husband. Um mm -hmm. you know don't don't get divorced. Right. You know, kill your sin. Don't use pornography. Don't get drunk. Don't, mm -hmm. don't don't get angry. That sort of thing. And a lot of that's true. And I mean, I think it, I think we, you know, our great great grandparents knew those sorts those sorts of things yep. <laughs> and somehow got lost, you know, in the last 50, 60 years uh, for different reasons. Uh, you mentioned on page 26 uh, and kind of go through it a little bit more. Uh, you mentioned Air Jordan sneakers, jewelry, certain mm. name brand fashions. They were all coveted items. Everyone wanted to have certain brands and labels, your jeans, your shirts, your jackets. It was cool to have gold chains, high dollar Nike shoes, which, you know, that's still a thing today, right? Right. Um, talk a little bit about that. What do you see the difference between then, 30 years ago, uh, you grown up then, and what your kids deal with? Uh, you have middle teenagers, right? Adolescents. Yep. What what's the pro what's the pros and cons? Do you see it's exactly the same? It's worse? It's a little bit better? What are your thoughts? Well, it, you know, there's some of the same things like you mentioned. You know, kids still covet. I, I mean, you know, I, I got to say that my my son, you know, he has more Nike shoes than I ever had. Um, <laughs> you know, you know, but thank God, you know, we go to Nike outlets where they have fair prices. You know, they're right. we're buying a hundred dollar tennis shoes and all of that. But yeah. you know, but you know, he has more stylish shoes. I can say than I had growing up because I didn't have very much. And so we're more privileged and more blessed to be able to do that. And so, but he's, but there's still this, oh, dad, I want those Jordans. And there's still this desire to, 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 you know, in our sort of uh, a pop culturized, you know, <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, America where, you know, everybody desires to be stylish, to, to get attention, the kind of attention that says, yeah, they've got the latest thing. They've got those name brand, those fashions, you know, these kinds of fashions they're wearing and so forth. So, you know, so kids want to follow that, you know, there's this tendency to still want to do that. And so that's not changed. What has changed in this generation, like you said, is the technology access and access to information, access to the social media stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, my kids aren't, don't have a big social media presence. They do have phones um, because, you know, they go to school, you know, you know, get on the school buses and so forth. And my, my son's in high school, 17. So, um, you know, he walks home independently and, and from time to time and things like that. So I want them to have phones for that purpose. Uh, but we're constantly telling them, one, about the dangers of social media. They don't get on, you know, uh, Facebook and, and, and Instagram. Like, uh, you know, I've worked at, in, in public education for 20 years mm -hmm. um, as both a teacher and a school administrator. And so I saw, you know, kids, you know, who were getting bullied online, kids who were you know, uh, uh, you know, getting into fights because of, you know, online, you know, a uh, uh, co conflict that was, you know, sort of coming to coming to pl play because, you know, one kid was 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 <laughs> getting into some sort of verbal altercation with another kid about some girlfriend or shoes or clothes or put downs wow. for whatever reason. You're in this click. I'm in that click. I don't like your click. I don't like your group or whatever the deal is. And they're getting in all of these these issues and these problems. Um, and so that was something, you know, Years ago, when I was I was in high school, I mean, kids were clickish, but I think it's been magnified and amplified in this generation mm -hmm. because of what they have access to, right? And 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 how pop culture has been just you know sort of shoved into their faces and shoved down throats. It, it's been said, you know, and I saw this in the school system. You know, kids now are are, are identifying as non-binary simply because of what they're seeing on TikTok, right? Right. Exactly. Kids are now, yeah. uh, you know, who are, are talking about they're coming out as trans or, or gay simply because they're identifying with and sympathizing with messages that they see on TikTok and on Instagram and things like that. Um, and, and those things are spreading like wildfire. Right. And we're seeing there's a social contagion that has really come about, uh, you know, amongst teens and, and this generation of kids because of the messages that they're being fed. And ha ha here's what's happening. Like you said, those things are taking place of the family. The family is supposed to be the central unit in which kids are infused with 
the word of God, who they are as image bearers, and what's God's view of who you are, your identity. Um, parents are supposed to be filling that role. And now phones and social media and, and what's coming through, um, you know, you know, pop culture is, is taking the place of family. So I, I think that's the major difference to answer your question. Yeah. I think that's the major difference of what our, this generation and my kids' generation are, are facing. But um, prayerfully, we're, we're, we're doing the job of trying to combat those things as, as parents, yeah. right? And as, and as spiritual leaders in the home. Um, and, and I'm talking to my kids all the time about it. And, you know, my kid has never come home, you know, complaining about how they're getting bullied online. So, forth and so forth because they, they don't really have that much of an online presence. And, yeah. you know, we've kind of counseled them through that. And we're, you know, sort of working through, uh, you know, a lot of those those pitfalls that they need to be aware of, as well as the, you know, the other, you know, uh, spiritual pitfalls that the online presence actually also um, sort of presents, you know, with pornography and things like that. And so, you know, that's, that's also, you know, back in my, in our day, in the 80s, I'm coming up, you know, as a young kid, if we wanted to watch something or, or look at something that was inappropriate, somebody had it on a VHS tape and you had to find that guy. Or yeah. there was a magazine behind a store counter somewhere and you had to, <laughs> had to know yeah. a guy who could have access to it to get it so somebody could see it. You know, there was no phone we could look at in some device that we can just scroll through now where it's at your fingertips. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you, you had yeah, to work a little harder to go send. <laughs> it's, I mean, speaking of yeah, pandemic proportions, I mean, that's just, it's a raging wildfire just out yeah. of control yeah. uh and of course you know there's uh safe eyes covenant eyes accountable to you there's a lot of apps mm -hmm. uh that that uh, i would encourage everybody everybody to use at least in a capacity even for men because you know it's good to have that extra layer sure because, i mean sure. I, I think sometimes we think this like pious like well it's just behavior modification it's like well Part of that, yes, but, mm -hmm. you know, as I mean, I was exposed at nine to pornography mm. uh, and this was in the mid 90s, uh, early yeah. 90s and nine, 10, probably 10, but it was printed. Right. And then eventually, oh, VHS, what's this? This is more. This is live action. And uh, I mean, that royally screwed me up. I mean, it really did. And there's still images that get tattooed literally sure. onto Absolutely. your brain. And there's, you know, TED Talk after TED Talk and other kind of scientific -y, non Bible that people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. And it's like, well, that's what Proverbs 5 says. That's what Proverbs 7 says. That's what, mm -hmm. you know, Romans 1 is talking about. That's just where, you know, Ephesians 5 and 6 and duh, but somehow it like gets lost if it's Bible. We're like, well, it's not real. I'm not religious. And you're like, <laughs> right. Even as a kid, you right. know, you had somebody who's, you know, 16 or 20 or, you know, mm -hmm. they're rolling their eyes with their dad. Okay. Yeah, dad, sure, fine. And hey, bud, this is this is dangerous. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and yet at the yeah. same time, they might watch a twenty minute TikTok or um, TED talk, and oh wow, this is this is this is damaging my brain. It's like absolutely, you know, <laughs> you know? right, right, right. The world but is seeing it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's funny. It's it's funny and sad at the same time. Yeah. And if I could, uh, Richard, you you mentioned a quote that I, I, didn't, I didn't get. A, I don't think I got a chance to respond to right at the start of this, where I talked about how, that God made us in His image, and we were not created to to just pursue. Yeah. You know, the, the, the flesh. Right. We're not um, pursued to have unbridled sex. We're, we're, we're you know, we're not created for those things, um, but we're created for a higher purpose um, and created to pursue God and created to to do productive things. And once we understand that as, as image bearers of God, we can we can then live a life that, you know, is on a higher plane of existence that, you know, that we can contribute, we can contribute to family and society effectively. And, and the enemy knows that. The enemy knows. I, I remember, listen, it was it was sad, but I heard um, rapper DMX before mm -hmm. he passed away. He Somebody asked him, he said, man, what, what do you do with your time? You know, what do you do all day? He said, man, here's what I do. I'm doing my, my DMX impression. <laughs> here's what <laughs> I do. He said, he, crazy around, voice, getting, yeah. he, he said he gets around getting getting high, drinking and having sex. You know, so he, I, think, he, I don't think he mentioned that. Uh, you know, I don't, don't want to say he was having sex randomly, but, you know, with his wife or whatever. But he yeah. said he, he wanted to spend his day just having sex. And, and, and getting high and drinking, right? And wow. so that was his existence for him, you know, at that time in his life. I don't know, I don't want to say that that, you know, was uh, representative of, of every single moment of his life, or every single period of his life. But at that time when he was being interviewed, he said that's what he spent his time and you know, pursuing. And so I, I just began to say to myself, wow, that's a, such a low level existence. Not yeah. to judge him, but that's a, such a low level existence for us. As the scripture says, we are not to live as debtors to the flesh. Yeah. We are not to, we are not to live 
you know, as, as, as slaves to the sinful desires and the passions, as Paul the Apostle began to say in the book of Colossians, that we should not be living according to the passions, the sinful passions. We ought to put those things off, as he was saying. And so as, as, as I began to say how this wrecks the family, right, how it wrecks yeah. the family, it's because when that becomes the focus, we are not focused on the things that God has called us to to build spiritually. You know, a man who's 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 looking at porn is not a man who's praying. A man who's getting high is not a man who is discerning what his family needs. Yeah. A man who is, you know, given to those things are not, you know, I sat, you know, I sat and, and wrote a book over, over a six months period. I wrote a book. If I'm given to the things of the flesh, I'm not going to be in tune intellectually and spiritually to be able to write a book. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I don't have the mental capacity, you know, to, to do that, the, the intellectual and spiritual capacity to do that. If I'm given over to the flesh, you know, that takes that takes sacrifice. That takes commitment. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that when you're committed to the flesh. And that's why God, you know, created man to bear forth fruit, to be fruitful yeah. unto him, to bring forth the kind of works. One, we serve him, serve the church, serve our family, and we should be serving humanity. And we can't do that by serving the flesh. But anyway. No, I mean, that's and that's you know, you fold into that quite a bit with the hip hop culture and just looking at, and just, I mean, <laughs> a lot of it just sounds like a movie. I mean, obviously that's mm -hmm. not, was not my experience in Northern California uh, uh, with, you know, being more in the mountains, not in an urban context at all. And just kind of people that look like me and very different, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, I've seen the movies and you mentioned Spike Lee shot this movie here and there. And, right. And a lot of that, you know, I think, again, people see what's foreign or different and then we fear it, you know, or we don't like it or that's ah, not like me. Right. It's just we've been fed a lot of lies with, you know, woke wokeism and critical theory and stuff the last few mm -hmm. years. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Before we do, I'm curious. You mentioned Obama. Uh, mm -hmm. And I remember, I mean, again, I was in California. It's a blue state. McCain had no chance. I was already, you know, seeing my vote being not counted. Doesn't matter. Um, and I wasn't a fan of McCain by any means either, but I barely was barely was paying attention in 2008, uh, 2004. Likewise. I could even vote. <laughs> but I remember seeing Obama and thinking like, yeah, I mean, this guy, you know, he speaks well and, you know, this and this mm -hmm. and not a black America, not an Asian America, not a white America, but a, a United States of America. You know? Right. Like, right. Great. OK. You know, like, but like he's seems like a socialist, though. And yeah. socialism's not not good. You know, Jeremiah Wright and, and this mm -hmm. guy and. I'm forgetting the other influencer names. And lo and behold, it wasn't great. William right? Ayers. He, he was, he was, he was, yeah. he was a fan of William Ayers yeah, and that's right. Jeremiah Wright, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, of course. Yeah. Um, back in the days, he was more in the background, but Bernie Sanders was, you know, and, and, the, and folks of his ilk were certainly influences in his ideology, but go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I, I all I wanted to ask you, I don't, I don't know if you touched it on the book. Um, I don't remember, but what, I guess within the black community, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's a church or just work, life, education, you were in um, education for a long time. From 2007, so Obama, right, announcement, I think this guy's going to be the Messiah, you know, the political Messiah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people had that feeling from 2007 to, say, 2015, even into 2016. What was the tenor and kind of... Um, feeling that people had did it shift you know men women old young was there really just a gung-ho obama is the best he's gonna save america mm -hmm. and did that because a lot of people had that i mean if that right. was the case yeah anyway what, what did it shift did it get stronger did it get worse did people start to turn on obama yep good question people you know the uh, the same-sex marriage you know he mm -hmm. said i think in before he uh, before 2012 he said i think they should get married when he was against same-sex marriage before he right. was for it and Anyway, so yeah, good question. And I'm so, just curious, yeah. And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of speak to that from my from the perspective of you know my own vantage point, having voted for Obama in 2008. I, I voted for the guy, yeah, because in 2008 I was I was a lot less politically aware, um, a, a lot less politically discerning. You mm -hmm. know, I I did what we I voted because that was kind of like the first voting cycle at you know my first voting cycle as an adult number one, as a young adult. Um, and I always voted and, and thought in the direction of the herd, right? Most black people, a lot of black churches, you know, supported the democratic platform. And yeah. so even my own church at the time, 
supported the Democratic platform um, because it was just a historical reality that that's a lot oftentimes what was going on in the black community. Um, but that wasn't always the case in the black community, by the way. But it, it, for, for a long time, it has been, um, and, you know, you know, pre-civil rights, post-civil rights um, for whatever reason. However, uh, I voted for Obama ignorantly. The things that I saw about him on the surface, he talked family. I remember he sat at, he was at Saddleback Church when Rick Warren invited yeah. him to Saddleback Church. And I heard him talk about family and I heard him, you know, give a position about what he believed about the family. And I said, okay, well, this guy seems pretty good. He's talking, you know, some pretty good things. And, and I'll be honest with you. I voted for him because he was a person of color who could speak well and and he had he was knowledgeable, he was intelligent, you know, he had family, you know, his family was intact. I was like, man, that's a good image. That's a good look right there, you know. Yeah. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I voted in that direction. A lot of people like me did did as well. Now, when I began to grow spiritually, right, and my and the the Holy Spirit, the Lord through the word of God began to give me more spiritual um more spiritual lenses to see the world and in my biblical worldview begin to become the lens through which I would now begin to start, start to see things a little bit clearer. Um, I saw him for who he was. And mm. I said, Oh, I, I said, I can't vote this direction. So I didn't vote for Obama the second go around. Yeah. And I think there were a lot of people who were coming around that way who, who had the same revelation. Now there were still more people than not who were still supporting Obama in the black community and, and so forth, people who were supporting. But there were people like me who were waking up. Mm. There were people like me, and even more so up to the period of Trump, um, there were more people waking up, you know, seeing like, hey, look, look at the things that his, you know, his presidency um, and the legacy of his presidency was leaving behind. And it was very much different. You know, it was, a, you know, it seemed like that Obama who I voted for in 2008, that was simply a smokescreen. That was simply a, 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 a mask, right. And, and, a, and a, and a facade. And that was, that was, you know, actually a Trojan horse effort to bring in what the real is, you know, bring in the real, uh, you know, whatever the real, um, his real agenda was. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, yeah, a lot of people started to wake up. What you have, what you have had in the last four to six years, um, or you know, four to eight years, are a lot of you know black conservative, you know, black Christians who are coming around to start to see, you know, the evils of the 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 liberal leftist platform, and it's not just on a political level, right? It's not just political, but to see the spiritual, you know, uh, impetus behind what's going on in the platform on that platform you yeah. know what i'm saying with you know with the, the the marxist agenda the you know the you know the agenda against the family um you know there's the woke agenda um all of those things you know are anti-family anti-god and you know i'm just of the, uh, the of the idea that true christians cannot lend their support to it and i think a lot of people have been awakened to that a lot more need to be but it, yeah. it's, it's certainly been a shift in, in some regard yeah, no, I pray that this, you know, this conversation and conversations like it uh, will will do that. We're in the sense of people, you know, the the less less gifted of us. They're melanated, although I, I do get pretty dark. Uh, again. <laughs> but listen, the only thing that separates all of us are degrees of melanin, brother. That's right. You know, so. Amen. Um, but, you know, there's there's been part of me in the past. It's definitely less so in the last couple of years when I've really you know, been producing content like this and just saying, you know what? Life's too short. God's God's in control. Christ is king. Let's just go for this. But even still, there's, you know, the little whispers of like, ah, you're just going to be called a racist, though. You can't talk about these issues. You're mm -hmm. not that thing. You're not that person. You're not part of that community, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Kind of the argument leftists use with, well, you don't have a uterus. You can't talk about abortion. Exactly. Blah, blah. Exactly. And of course, you know, well, and, and let me say something to that, Richard, not to cut you off. Let me say, no. and let me say something to that since you're on that point. It's a great point. So first of all, um, they called Daniel Patrick Moynihan a racist for pointing out what he did in his report, right? They called him a racist. And now look where we are, 75% Father Athens. He said, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> he said, we have a problem on our hands. And he said, if we don't get a hold of this, it's going to get out of control. And lo and behold, he was he speak, spoken like a prophet. He was correct. Larry Elder says this. I don't know if you listen to Larry Elder much, but Larry Elder said I this. Some, yeah. He said, listen, he said, this whole idea that we've gotten into, in black America you know that that black people, you know, are treated like ch children who, to whom the truth cannot be told. Mm. 
He said they're treated like children to whom the truth cannot be told. It doesn't mean that all black people act that way or have that have that uh, ideology. However, the 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 woke contingents, right? The woke contingency treats minorities that way. They yeah. want the, the the feminist movement treats people that way. Um, they want that to be the, the 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 political or cultural social climate of the day that you can't speak truth. And here's why. Because if you can't speak truth to people, then they become dependent upon lies. They become dependent upon the propaganda. They become dependent upon the government because the government feeds you. And doesn't that sound oddly like a Marxist communist state that 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 mind controls its people through propaganda? It doesn't even have to be true. And in fact, what they do is they will demonize those in society who point out facts and truth. Mm -hmm. They demonize you. They say that you're racist. They use, watch how they use pejoratives and the most incendiary comments to describe people who go against, right? And I'm getting, you can tell I get a little fiery about this topic. No, it's, <laughs> it's good. Amen. You know, the, the, how they, they, they demonize and use the most incendiary, you know, uh, labels for people who will dissent from yeah. the popular, you know, the, the, the herd, right? Because you know, Karl Marx, you know what he said? One of his five, one of his pillars, I don't know if it was five or six, or many, but he, the things that he wanted to dismantle, one was God and religion. Yep. He hated God and religion. He wanted to dismantle the nuclear family. He wanted to, 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 to dismantle um, national identity, you know, nations. And, 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 you know, he wanted to like topple government, you know, topple government so that there was a uh, government instability and national uh, identity instability. He also wanted to, to, to dismantle individuality. If you are a dissenter, and then go to all your communist countries, anybody who dissents from the government, dissents from the state, they find you, they single you out, they persecute you, they take you down, they'll even kill you or imprison you. Mm. They want to find those people. And oddly enough, America, who used to, like a communist and a Marxist is one of the worst things you could you, you used to could you you used to be. Mm -hmm. You could the, the worst thing you could be in America was a <clears throat> communist or a communist sympathizer, right? That, that, you know, you didn't want to be that. Because that was anti-American. That's not who we were. It's not who we are. But now in America, if you dissent from the ideas of LGBTQ support, if you dissent from woke ideology, if you're, you know, they want to tag you, peg you, publicly identify you. You're not, you're not someone who wants to, you know, who you reject the intermuscular jab. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you if you reject it, the intermuscular biologic, right? Mm. Uh, if you if you're somebody who reject, what do they do? They single you out, they peg you, you know, and, and then ostracize you, right? Because that's setting the stage for the kind of America that the Marxist agenda, and by the way, the civil rights movement was actually co-opted and, and, and infiltrated by Marxists who used that and rode in on the backs of the civil rights movement to bring in Marxism. And that's what we see at the undertones of all the conversations of civil rights today is Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to say everybody's racist. The system is oppressive. The system is, you know, oppression and so forth. Everybody's an oppressed group. Everybody's a victim. And so that's the, 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 the you know, the, the idea of the day. And so that's now become the thing that is used to, to dismantle, you know, we have to dismantle the powers of people who have too much money, too much power, too much influence. Yeah. So that's all white people, all men, you know, and all, you know, religion, Christianity. Let, let's, you know, we got to topple their systems because they're the ones who influence the ideas of people. They're the ones who have the most power and money. And that's Marxism to get rid of capitalism, to get rid of the, the, the hegemonic power. Right. Everybody's a victim. And so it's the victim who are the most empowered and the most, you know, the marginalized are the ones who we need to focus on and give, you know, and give our attention to in our society. And they are the people who are the most honorable and most virtuous. And everybody else is demonized. It's mm. because the state wants that to be the, the, the cultural uh, uh, temperature of the day so that the state can be in control. And now the state can infuse its, its, its assert its power and its uh, 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 structure of godhood, really. Right. The state wants to be God. And once the once the, the society is, is 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 unstable because everybody distrusts everybody, then the state steps in. So anyway. Yeah. No, that's a bunch of truth bombs right there, brother. I mean, yeah. and that, and they, that's something that we see. Um, I mean, really the difference. I, mean, I remember even in the Southern Baptist Convention, I really have only been paying attention the last couple of years. I didn't grow up in it, but went to Southern Seminary. Of course, it's the 
one of the big seminaries within the convention. Of course, it's the biggest denomination in America, et cetera, et cetera. And it was even 2018 was the MLK 50 event. And yeah. then 2019, which was like, OK, yeah, I mean, this is you know, pretty good. Maybe he wasn't like the sharpest, best Christian, but like, you know, I, he did have some good things and he said some good things. And you contrast even, you know, I have a dream speech mm -hmm. and, and my children will live in America, but they won't be judged by the con the, the character color, or right, uh, color the skin, color their skin yeah. but content of character. And now you look at that and you're like, mm -hmm. oh, wait. But you just literally said the opposite of MLK. Meanwhile, it's like, yeah, MLK, Malcolm X. <laughs> and they kind of have shied away, you know, especially with the, the summer of love and all the BLM riots of 2020 and so on. Yep. You know, now they're kind of they co-opt and find new martyrs. And sadly, you know, some of them are people that get get killed uh, for one reason or another by a police. And then they're a martyr. And then this. And now we're Trump saying their name, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And you're like, but you you're not. You're godless. Like, yeah. I mean, even the BLM website, they don't, oh, like, yeah. I don't think it says it anymore. No, but, no, they took it down. You know, oh, we want to destroy the nuclear family. We're, mm -hmm. we're trans, Absolutely. blah, blah, blah. We're LGB, blah, blah, blah. We're this and yep. this and this. You know, the hege hegemonic powers, they're bad. The oppressed and the white man's bad. And it's like, that wasn't the message from MLK no. and, and no. civil rights at all. No. You know, no. but I think a lot yeah. of people don't know that. It's crazy. Yep. And, they don't, and, and, it's, and the sad thing, Richard, is that... Many in the churches today, a lot of our black brothers and sisters who are believers have bought into this idea of civil rights under the banner of the BLM movement. Yeah. And they have ignored and, 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 and turned a blind eye for whatever reason mm. to the to the true heinous, you know, nefarious nature of BLM for the sake of, you know, civil rights. And, and mind you, they're doing that. Oh, they did that um, under the premise of a false narrative that police are hunting down and killing black people indiscriminately when that's been actually disproven. I don't know if you know who Roland Fryer is, but Roland Fryer is a black Harvard economist who is not a conservative, mind you. He's not a conservative. He's a black Harvard economist, economist who went into the research and said, listen, I'm sick of hearing this narrative. Mm -hmm. The police are, are, are killing blacks indiscriminately. This is one of the biggest issues facing black people today. I'm going to bear out the data and show everybody that the, the real, you know, nefarious, you know, issue behind police brutality and so forth. And it's happening and I'm going to find it. What he found, he said, was the most surprising finding of his career that there was actually not a disparity of, of, of police shootings against blacks. In fact, it was the opposite mm. that blacks, that the police were less likely to shoot a black uh, a person. And that, you know, that, that, you know, one, this, the data is this, that there are uh, over a thousand police shootings annually, a thousand police shootings annually uh, of those thousand, 500 of those are whites. So that's mm. uh, those killed by police actually killed. Uh, of those thousand police deaths at the shootings of police by the by the hands of police, five hundred of those are white people, two hundred and fifty ever black, right? And the other percent are others. So who gets killed by the police more? It's white people, right? But you would they would say, well, it happens to black people at higher rates because blacks only make up thirteen percent of the population, and two hundred and fifty blacks represents a higher rate of black people dying at the hands of police. But what they don't talk about is that the reason that police are now interacting in those in those situations is because the homicide rate in the black community is astronomical <clears throat> compared mm. to the white community, Hispanic community, and the Asian community. There, um, and this is this is a statistic that's hard to say. If you were a white person, yes, you would be called racist for saying what I'm about to say. That number one, uh, of all the homicides in America, 50% of the homicides in America are committed by blacks. B blacks commit more homicides at three times the rate of whites, Hispanics, and Asians combined. Wow. And so when you say police interaction with blacks, of, of those who die at the hands of police, 250 of them die annually, 500 of them die, die annually who are white, you, you would think that more black people would die at the hands of police based on the number of homicides and the, and the amount of police interaction that actually goes into the to the high homicide areas and crime rates.
mm. that actually occurred. So it's actually much lower than we would think it would be based on the amount of crime that we see. And so Harvard Econ- uh, uh, the Harvard economist, Roland Fryer, said this was the, the most surprising finding of my career, that he found out that police were not discriminating against blacks by, by, by shootings. Now, he said that he did find that there was some high level, high rates of brutality in terms of excessive force. But why would you think there would be excessive force? Wouldn't you think there'd be excessive force because they don't want to kill the people, right? right? Because they don't want to be pegged as racist and they don't want to be the latest um, you know, a, a stigmatized, you know, agency for killing another black person. You don't want to be that, right? Who wants to go home losing their pension, you know, because yeah. you're caught in lit- litigation, right? And he, the interesting thing is that he's that they he, he went into the research and had a data a research team. He scrapped, he found the data. He was like, wow, this can't be true. He scrapped that, that research team and got a whole new research team and got the same data. Wow. And so it was overwhelmingly that this is not true. So I said all that to say, the whole be like my black brothers and sisters who got on that BLM bandwagon who are who are Christian. I don't I don't I don't I'm not even concerned about the blacks who are not Christians. My Christian black brothers and sisters who were, who were at this MLK 50 thing and they were saying we ought to sympathize with the BLM message and things like that. And I'm like, no, we don't. Yeah. Yes, we should support blacks who are absolutely and actually and, and any black, any person, black or otherwise, we should absolutely support people who are discriminated against and who are marginalized and oppressed, who are actually oppressed but we should not ride you know the the bandwagon of a narrative that's false that's based on a false premise and that that actually is a trojan horse as they said themselves they want to be the the conduit to which they you know that they bring in the lgbtq agenda and that's what they were about they don't care about black people because if they did they would care about everything that faces the black community and the lives of black the black community like the lives of aborted babies who have who happen to be aborted in the black community at three times the rate of other communities yeah the planned parenthood uh, uh, uh hubs are found in black communities at the rate of 70 percent 70 percent of them are found within miles of a black community 70 percent of them are located in their black communities 33 percent of all aborted babies are black when black women only make up seven percent of the nation mm. yeah. so 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 wow. so that points to a more nefarious you know uh 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 um mission that Margaret Sanger had when she actually, you know, at the foundations of the Planned Parenthood, you know, a, a birth of the organization, you know, that she said she wanted to get rid of all of the, the undesirables, blacks and Negroes, called the Negro yeah. Project. Human, human weeds, yeah. Human weeds. It was, you know, it was eugenics. And that was her her, 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 her mission from the outstart. And mm. she even said things like this, we want to get the black preachers in on this. We want black preachers to be the face of this so they can keep their rebellious Negroes in check that are in their churches who don't want to go along with this mission mm. of getting rid of the black weeds of our society. We want black ministers. And so today you have them. You have people like Raphael Warnock and people like uh, 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 Jamal Harrison Bryant mm. and all of these individuals in the black pulpits today in the largest black churches in America who are proponents of, uh, of Planned Parenthood and, and the right for women to choose. Yeah, when I mean, that's what the Nazis poems. did. Go ahead. Nazis did that in Germany. I mean, they, yeah. they, you know, a lot of the German Christians knew that and they swallowed up. I mean, they already had a, you know, higher criticism and things infected, which, you know, I, I don't know how much, depending on where you at or you're at, I guess, as far as a Baptist church or Pentecostal church or, um, uh, in terms of my own, my own church, AME church and things. No, no, I'm saying like just black churches in general, like oh, gotcha. right, how much right, or how right. little they really adhere to the word of God, right. And right. as infallible and inerrant and so Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Um, you know, so there's that, and that was in Germany 80, 90 years ago with, well, maybe the Bible's not really authoritative that much anyway. So, you know, the government, they know best, you know, and obviously there's, there's a lot of parallels there. It's ugh, absolutely, it's crazy. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, um, what I want to get, we'll kind of, I think, close out with, um, some of the, a little more of the woke ideology and just look at that. Yeah. Um, but before we get there, what, so from the 1900s, so mm-hmm. rewind 100, 110 years back from today to 1960, because it's already 65 is, you know, Lyndon Johnson. Of course, he was VP. He was made president after JFK was assassinated <clears throat> by one person, supposedly. Um, and <laughs> all of the, all of the show. Right. But um, so 
LBJ, Lynn Bain Johnson, he's there and Moynihan's working for him. And Moynihan sees there's this issue. There's already 25%, significantly mm-hmm. higher. Now all the numbers are inflated even worse, right? As you just said and have covered here and you do extensively in your book. It's already 25%, the one in four in 1964, 65. What happened from 1910, 1920 mm. to 1960? What, what was going on? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And so uh, my, my, I would conjecture uh, or, or theorize, uh, infer that what you had was, now watch this, Moynihan, one of the vantage points that he had for pointing out the issue that he saw was that he experienced it himself being in the Irish community. Mm. He actually pointed out that growing up Irish, number one, he grew up without a dad. So people would pay, see, see, one, people shouldn't judge. And the people were saying, oh, you're racist. That's why you're trying to point out how, how defective the black community is. Well, he said, number right. one, I'm seeing things that I saw in my own community as an Irish person because the Irish community went through a similar pathology. Uh, right. Wow. The Irish slums, they called them the wild Irish slums and the Irish ghettos. Right. Right. There was father absence. Moynihan's dad left his home. He grew up in a single parent home. Right. At a, for a span of time in his life. And so um, I, I think what he saw, he said that, again, because of the urbanization. Right. When, when you saw the 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 the, uh, the people, people who were flooding uh, and, and immigrating, migrating to these urbanized areas, um, you started to see some of these pathologies because number one, I think you started to see the rise of feminism, the rise of sexual revolution. And he said those things impacted the Irish community, mm. right? You know, the, the the people departing from God. A lot of people were leaving the South, which is more of a Bible belt and going to more of the Northern cities where people weren't going to church as much. Mm. So people were getting away from the nuclear family, ideas of nuclear family, people getting away from the ideas of, uh, of, 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 you know, of biblical morals where you had more of, you know, those things weighing on your conscience in the South when people were going to church, your grandma and your, and your great aunt and them and your aunt or your granddad, they would tell you, boy, you, you, you sleeping with that woman or you, you, you shacking up with that girl. You shouldn't, you ought not be doing that. I want to yeah. get away to the North, but nobody's telling me what to do. And so you had yeah, these people flocking well. to the North and what's again, what's packing packed in the culture in the sixties, free love, yeah. right? That's, that's burgeoning. You know what I'm saying? Free love, free thinking, you know. Uh, and so as that revolution starts and begins, you start to see that growth. And what fueled that is what, what, what took off and prepared and, 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 and that that, you know, rocket that took off and, and from and plat- from that platform and lo- that launch pad was the welfare state, which went, took it from 25 to 75. So, uh, again, to answer your question, I think it was uh, folks leaving the 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 the, the restriction, the restrictive ideas of the bible belt mm. going to the urban areas flooding the urban areas more populated you started seeing things more like you know hey they have gambling rings and casinos and things like that and people are getting into pathologies of you know and access to things that you didn't have in the south yeah as, as wow. readily put it that way as readily accessible in the south yeah. right now it's more accessible and now you population start to grow because now people are giving away love free and 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 we're, we're casting off the restraint of religious ideas Right. And mm-hmm. so it, it, we start to get away from what I what I was taught. You know, that actually was the truth. Of my own family. My grandmother left the South, you know, way back when and went up north to New York City and end up having my mother out of wedlock. Mm-hmm. But they were as her family, her mom and dad were together until death. Right. I mean, like, till like in their 80s, and you know, uh, and, and, and 90s, you know, that, you know, they I mean, you know, my great grandfather. Um, remarried, but his 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 wife passed away. But they were together forever, yeah. you know. <laughs> and wow. so you you started to see a generation in the Carolinas. In the Carolinas, correct. And so you started to see. And so here's the interesting thing. And so my great grandfather would have been the child, the, either the child of a slave or a slave themselves. My great grandparents would have been slaves or children of slaves. And so they came from intact families, even out of slavery, wow. right? And you saw that being the 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 way of life for generations up until the sixties. But anyway. Yeah, no, it's, it, <clears throat> I think, I mean, this is again, I say it often. I mean, why I think history is such a good teacher because it's, you can actually understand something and say, Oh, that's how it is. Not mm-hmm. this. Cause you listen to CNN or watch, you know, random videos on Instagram or TikTok or whatever, uh, or YouTube. And you have personalities or politicians who are saying this or that. 
And you're like, yeah, I mean, I guess that makes sense. We just need to give this this group of people more money. They're obviously getting killed by police and they're 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 this and they're that. And we just need to give them a leg up. We need to do this. And, that. and you're like, but that's what's been causing the problem for the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole leg up is is the opposite. I mean, it's like having a you know bucket of gas and you're like, well, it's liquid. I mean, it looks like water. Throw it on that kitchen fire and I hope it works. And, right. you know, and you throw it on there and it spreads and you're like, ah, throw more water on there. That didn't work. And you're like, it's gas. Quit doing that. Like it's not helping the right. kitchen fire. Right. And so I think a lot of people, you got to go back further. Well, why did the, why did the kitchen fire start? Oh, because this person put, you know, potholders on there and they turned on the, the, the stove. Well, don't do that. You got to, you got to unplug this. You got to find right. real water, find a real solution, not something that looks like a solution, which would be, you know, gasoline. You know, you're not going to hand out more stuff, reparations, uh, free this, you know, give me the, the Anglo or the, the black seven over the Anglo eight. Matt Chandler. <laughs> By the way, that or anything quote, else. I mean, all that, those, that quote, I mean, it's all over. People say that sort of nonsense. It's yeah. Crazy. That quote by Matt Chandler, by the way, is it, it triggers me. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> I, I knew that. That's why I wanted. No. Um, yeah, it's it's just unbelievable. All right. So let's wrap up with this. I mean, because this is what we're dealing with now. I mean, obviously, we want to go back to the 19 teens and the 20s and even look at 1965, what was already happening. And that's I think that's very insightful what you're saying with a comparison to Irish Italian, same thing. Mm -hmm. And of course, now all, all of these days, everybody's white, including a lot of Jewish people. You know, it's just white versus black, which exactly. 100 years ago, you know, there was the Irish, right, there, was, right, there right. was the English. And it was really, it was almost just like English people were the only real white ones, you know, right. and then there's there's Hispanic, non-white Hispanic. And then there's, and you, you fill yeah. out those little papers and you're like, white and non-white and Hispanic and not, and you're like, how are there all these categories? Like, right. Anyway, so it's, it's everybody kind of gets lumped in almost. And you're just you're erasing people's heritage. You're erasing um, the same types of things that are seen both today and 100 years ago or 60 years ago within the black community or uh, Asian community, Hispanic community, Irish, Italian and so on. It's it's I don't know. It's crazy. Um, page 70, you mentioned mm. uh, you said the headings are problem number two. You said second contributing factor, the demise of the black family situation is liberal political propaganda and social justice rhetoric, otherwise known as woke quote unquote ideology. If I could sum it up, the prevailing message coming from the democratic platform the last decade is it would be, Hey, if you're a minority of any kind, you're a victim. And if you're a person of color, you're a victim of hopelessly racist system. That's solely to blame for your current predicament. Uh, and then you mentioned Moynihan later in this uh, uh, clip here as well, or uh, paragraph uh, as well. How, I mean, I guess we can kind of land the plane with this and yep. you can add anything else. I'll pull up the, the link for the book as well for everybody. But how do we get out of that? I mean, again, the mainstream media owns, is owned by the Democrats or vice versa, or, yep. or they're, they're all playing for the same team. We'll just say, yep. uh, at least it seems like, and how do we get out of that? I mean, how does especially, yeah. well, anybody, but especially believers, you know, whether more or less melanated, whether they mm -hmm. speak more than one language yep. or whatever, how do we get out of this? I think it's the robust preaching and teaching and conversations of biblical truth, brother. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that, right. We would agree, yeah. but um, you know, as we have in robust conversations, the, 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 the pulpit has to be the place where um, and outside of the like teaching of the people, from the pulpit, robust teaching and preaching of truth from the pulpit, and then people who are taking that and those the, the biblical worldview and having robust conversations in our society and doing things like this, having platforms where we're talking about these things. Um, so I think I think it's all of that, right? Living a life in which the biblical worldview becomes um, what you know part of our discourse. Right. Yeah. And that we're, we're using that to inject it in the culture and, and, and to combat the, you know, and be countercultural. Right. Counterintuitive to, you know, these ideas. So one of the things I said in, in, in you know, quote from the book, you know, just real, real quick, if I, you know, the idea of the woke 
ideology coming out of the leftist platforms is if I can convince you that you're a victim, then you will always look outside of yourself for the source of your problem. And you will subsequently look outside of yourself for the solution, which is government. Right. right. It seems that any conversation about what black people can do to, or black men can do to become more consistent fathers, responsible husbands, protectors of the home, like you're labeled as, you know, you're victim blaming, you're victim shaming, you're racist. Um, but, you know, what better strategy to maintain political political voter allegiance than to convince people that they are hopeless to change their own situation and that you alone have the solution to their problem, the government. You, the government has the solution to your problem. You don't have it. So they, they, they're, they're promoting this idea that you are not capable of getting yourself out of this. You're just a victim. You let us handle it for you. Let us be your savior. And we have to have the kind of conversations that show people and point to the, the, the you know, the examples of people like, no, 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 we're not victims. Mm. We're, we're, the government's not our solution. It's the word of God. It was the word of God in the Bible, in the biblical worldview for me. Right. And we have to tell our brothers and sisters, do not get on this woke bandwagon. It's damaging. And regardless of how, how ostracizing, you know, how ostracized we become and how we, you know, how, how they, you know, they might keep us at arm's length or criticize us. But they'll say we're anti, you know, uh, you know, again, they might say you're racist or you're, you're, you're a racist sympathizer. You're, an, you're sympathizing with your oppressors as me as a black person. You're sympathizing with your oppressors. And so regardless of what Uncle they say, Tom. Uncle, Uncle Tom, Tom. Yeah. right, you know, um, regardless of what they say, we have to combat it with the truth and facts. And yeah. say, you know what? I'm going to turn my face like Flint. I don't care what you say. I'm going to continue to point to the examples. I'm black. I was not a victim. I worked and did this. I went to school. And yes, any other person who was born in poverty and so forth, so on, you can do the same thing too. Let me show you. I'm not just going to point to you and point at your situation and say, do better and pull yourself up by the bootstraps. I'll say, yes, let me show you how I did this. Let me tell you about my story. That's why my, I feel my book is important. And people, you know, who have, you know, stories like mine, you know, people and people who can perpetuate and point to the story. You know what I'm saying? You as a brother, Richard, hey, listen, I know a brother who came from a situation of poverty and growing up in the inner city. You know, he wrote this book. Let me show it to you. You yeah. know, he actually, you know, from poverty said, listen, he had people supporting him from the church who showed him a better way. And it was the gospel mm. that was the actual saving grace in his life. That's and right. uh, reading the word of God that told me if I work hard as a man, take care of my family, take care of my responsibilities. I'm accountable. I'm not living life in, in, in sexual immorality and things like that. Then guess what? Here's this thing called the uh, 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 the the uh, the millennial success sequence. Here's what it says. The millennial sex success sequence says, if anybody, I don't care if you're black, white, or otherwise, you're growing up in the Appalachian Mountains or you're growing up in, 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 in Compton, California, if you finish high school, man, finish high school, you, you don't have children out of wedlock, you get a job, don't quit that job before getting another one, mm. don't have kids till you're married. Nobody in America who does that is in poverty. Watch, mm. look at that. Nobody who does that is American. Wow. And that's according yeah. to a study by both left and right, you know, conservative and liberal think tanks who have, you know, compiled data on that particular social reality, right? And that is yeah. totally in line with biblical principles. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. I mean, it's, I mean, you just go to the book of Proverbs alone, you'll get loads of that. Uh, man, that's good. Um, let's, let's pull up the book here because it's definitely, uh, I want everybody to, to see this because it's, not only something that needs to be read, um, but talked about. So everyone go buy this book, Missing Pillars. Uh, this is the website, store.bookbaby.com. I'll put it in the description here. It's only 12 bucks. Uh, it's 192 pages, but you do have Moynihan's report in there as well. So yours is about a buck 25, about 125 pages, your content. And then you've got an mm -hmm. appendix and things. And so sometimes people get a little scared of past 150 at least I've heard. <laughs> uh, but it, it reads really well um i haven't admittedly i haven't read the entire thing i've read about a third of it i will read more um or i'll read it all because it's it's so good and i just i wanted to have this discussion as soon as possible really just because it's it's one more one more thing to just say hey we need to get this out as fast as possible Amen. and everything uh, everything that i read for those listening go read this book uh, get this book, support uh, Brian and his family and just, just this message. Cause it's not just about you ultimately, right? It's about right, the truth. It's about the gospel. It's about the saving faith Absolutely. that is in Christ alone. Um, and that, 
you know, we don't, we, we need to fight. We need to be, I, lo- I love what you just said. We need to be like Flint and, to, and just to stand and just put right there and just take it on, take it on the chin if you need to and say, no, we're not going to do this. I'm not a victim. Right. That is a lie. I'm going to push right. back. And I'll just, I'll, I'll tell people and I tell people again uh, or often, you know, who cares? You know, who cares? Don't, don't worry about what they think. Care what God thinks. Fear God, not man. And um, that's definitely something that you exude, <laughs> both talking and, of course, writing. And, and your story is phenomenal. So, again, for everybody listening, watching, this is it's biographical, autobiographical. Of course, you wrote it, but it's it's more than that. It's not just your story. You're talking and you're folding in. Right. Uh, again, very well written and just just easy to read as well, uh, which I really appreciate. So everyone get this book. It is in the description in the um, it's a link in the description as well. So. Brian, I appreciate it, brother. Do you have any last thoughts? Uh, you no, uh, Richard, I, I, one, I want to say thank you again, brother, for, for, for having Absolutely. me on your platform. It was a pleasure to be with you. I hope, I hope this isn't the last time we get a chance to dialogue together. Oh, yeah. Love, love to connect with you. Um, and so, um, you know, just help helping to, as I mentioned, forward the conversation and amongst mm-hmm. other gospel oriented conversations. This is just how, you know, another level of conversation of how the gospel impacts social reality. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, the gospel for me was, you know, being pulled out of my situation, understanding that I was, you know, an image bearer made in the image of God who God was calling to be reconciled to himself. And that absolute impacted my social reality that changed my perspective of life. It it gave me a new perspective on what a man is, what a father is, a husband Mm -hmm. is right. And And a contributor to society, but all because of who God just understanding who God made me to be. So praise God for that. And thank you for lending your platform to have that conversation, brother. And Absolutely. Um, thank you so much and blessings to you and your family, man. Yeah. Well, you too, brother. I appreciate it. I, uh, like I said, I encourage everyone to check out missing pillars, go get this book, support Brian's work and just the message in general. So everyone else um, have a great day and God bless. <laughs>